So we start the fourth uh, session um, that will be chaired by Professor Liu Zhuakui. Uh, the political economy of the Belt and Road Initiative and the future of the European project, a normative and developmental dimension. Um, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, for Professor's introduction. Uh, in, this, in this panel, we have uh, three very distinguished uh, 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 speakers, panelists. One is from the Chinese embassy, the other is uh, from a university but have a very good background on the European Investment Bank. The last is, uh, uh, is a professor but also is, uh, has been good at the banking law and the finance. So I think this three distinguished Things in which the panelists will give us a very rich analysis and a background resource to our participants. So, um, firstly, I would like to invite uh, Wen Di Chen, Chen Wen Di, Chief of Political and Media Affairs Section, Chinese Embassy in Greece. Uh, Director Chen, please take your floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Liu. Thank you for your very, very kind and a little bit over-exaggerated introduction to me. I'm no more distinguished, at least uh, I think I'm not as distinguished as the weather today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director General. Thank you for your invitation uh, to the Chinese Embassy and to give us uh, an opportunity to brief all of you the positions and ideas of the Chinese side on the cooperation between uh, China and Greece under the framework of the Belt and Road. <coughs> and I would, I would also like to take this op opportunity to thank uh, the, the Las Caritas Foundation for their commitment uh, to enhancing the communication and exchanges, especially ac academic exchanges, between the two countries. Thank you very much. And China and Greece maintain traditional friendly relationship, as we all have known. Since the two countries established the comprehensive strategic partnership, the bilateral cooperation and exchanges in different areas have constantly witnessed new bright spots and new achievements. Uh, this year, in particular, Prime Minister, as we have all, all know, uh, Tsipras attended the second Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in late April, during which he also witnessed the signing of 2020 and two, uh, 2022 cooperation plan on key areas between China and Greece. President Pavlopoulos will Pay, pay a state visit to China and attend Asia Civilization Dialogue Conference next week. This is the first state visit by a Greek president to China in nearly 11 years. We believe that this visit will turn out to be a new milestone of China-Greece relations. Also, in, in the rest part of this year, there, there is much to be expected of important bilateral cooperation and exchanges. During the eighth leaders meeting of China CEC in Dubrovnik, Croatia in April, Greece was accepted as a full member. This admission has laid a new platform for the cooperation between China and Greece in Central and Eastern Europe and is also a bright spot of the development of China-Greece relations this year. We hope that Greece, as a new full member of the China CEC cooperation, can take efforts to integrate itself into the mechanism in a possibly quick and smooth manner, and thus work with all parties we work with all parties concerned to deepen the practical cooperation in various fields under the framework of the China CEEC cooperation. Greece is also expected to play an active role in connection with its own advantages 
in the construction and development of this cooperation mechanism, namely to contribute its signature initiatives for the mechanism. In this regard, the two countries' academic fields are expected to make valuable and constructive con contribution by putting forward suggestions and ideas for the two different governments. For recent years, joint construction of the Belt and Road Initiative has been one of the themes of China-Greece relationship. The bilateral relationship between China and Greece make new, progress, new progresses with the joint construction of the Belt and Road initi Initiative. On the one hand, based on the already well-laid foundation of the comprehensive uh, strategic partnership, Greece actively participates in the construction of the Belt and Road Initiative. In particular, Greece and China last year signed the Memorandum of Understanding on Intergovernmental Cooperation in the Joint Construction of the Belt and Road Initiative, which made Greece the first signatory among the developed European countries. On the other hand, the joint construction of the Belt and Road Initiative has also enlarged space for the two countries to foster the bilateral cooperation and then strengthen the relations. Greece is strategically located at the hub of Asia, Africa, and Europe, where the maritime Silk Road meets land Silk Road. It is an important country along the Belt and Road. So, geographic, uh, so geographically speaking, Greece is a natural Belt and Road partner. Greece is committed to building the country into the regional hub of connectivity. This development vision is highly identical with the key areas of the Belt and Road Initiative, such as power policy coordination, facilities connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration, people-to-people -people bond. From the perspective of policy orientation, the Belt and Road Initiative can smoothly complement the development strategy of Greece. This is the very reason that the Chinese and Greece, the Greek governments both attach great importance to the two countries' cooperation under the framework of joint construction of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the various circles of the two countries highly appreciate it highly appreciate this cooperation, also looking forward to new achievements in this regard. During the second Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, 40 leaders attended the round table, including heads of state government from 38 countries, including China, UN Secretary General, and Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. The participating parties had in-depth exchanges of views on the Belt and Road cooperation and reached broad consensus on high-quality Belt and Road cooperation, delivering substantial results. As State Councilor and Minister of Foreign Affairs Wang Yi pointed out recently when he gave an interview to the media on the outcomes of the BRF, with the second BRF as a symbol, a new vision for the BRI has been shaped at the new starting point. President Xi Jinping proposes the high quality Belt and Road cooperation, and his, his suggestion is not only the actual need to boost a robust and inclusive world economy, economic growth, but also a natural extension of the high quality development stage of China's economy. So the three key words of the second BRF as new starting point, a new stage, and high quality development. This is my personal understanding. So, and it remains a distinctive theme of this forum. During the forum, all participants mapped out a refining belt and road blueprint and further clarified the key points and ways of cooperation. All parties agreed to focus on deeper practical cooperation, more open and 
interconnected development and broader mutual benefit and win-win cooperation. All parties agreed to focus on high-quality infrastructure development and industrial cooperation and solve major problems such as financial support, investment environment, risk management, and control and people-to-people -people exchanges. All parties agreed to establish working mechanism and improve supporting facilities to gain more concrete results. The next step, according to the blueprint of President Xi Jinping drew up with the leaders of various countries during the second BRF, we will continue to jointly promote high-quality belt and road cooperation. In this, in this process, the joint construction of the Belt and Road Initiative of China and Greece will also have new opportunities. I think the new opportunities will be found in four areas. First, at the second BRF, all parties reached important consensus on promoting a global partnership of connectivity. We will strive to elevate the connectivity of infrastructure building international transportation and trade links such as China-Europe Railway Express and the new international land-sea trade corridor. The develop, the develop uh, economic cooperation and, the, uh, to, and develop economic cooperation zones and industrial parks. Under these circumstances, the construction of China-Europe land-sea express line will be upgraded the advantageous geographic potential of Greece will be further tapped into, and the role of Greece in the construction of the Belt and Road Initiative will be even more prominent. Second, we will stick to people-oriented concept and put our focus on people's livelihood as always. We will integrate with the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, give priority to poverty alleviation job creation, and livelihood improvement. We should have zero tolerance for corruption to see that the joint pursuit of Belt and Road cooperation will deliver true benefit to the people of participating countries and contribute to their social and economic development. Piraeus, as we gathered here, Piraeus is a pivot project of the Belt and Road Initiative. It has so far created, uh, I mean Piraeus Port, it has so far created more than 3,000 direct jobs and more than 10,000 indirect jobs for this region. So Piraeus Port is a vivid testimony to the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative benefits local economic uh, development and people's life. With the promotion of high quality Belt and Road cooperation, we can expect more projects like Piraeus Port, which will benefit the Greek people as well as the Chinese people. Third, we will establish a multi-layered cooperation framework step by step. We also will build, maintain, and develop various kind of bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral cooperation platforms and make them run in parallel with mutual promotion and thus providing strong mechanism support for the Belt and Road cooperation. This commitment means that different plans of China-Greece cooperation, namely the joint construction of the Belt and Road Initiative, the cooperation under the framework of China CEC cooperation, and the bilateral cooperation in general, will run in parallel with mutual promotion. Fourth, we will build bridges for exchanges and mutual learning among different cultures, deepen cooperation in education, science, culture, sports, tourism, health, and archaeology. In order to facilitate multifaceted people-to-people -people exchanges, people-to-people -people bond will lay the social and public foundation of the Belt and the Road Initiative. It can foster the people's friendship among the countries, along the belt and the road, and help, exchanges, and help exchanges and mutual learning between civilizations. Disprove the so-called clash of civilizations. 
So both China and Greece are ancient civilizations devoting to national rejuvenization. China is willing to fully tap the value of profound historical and cultural heritage of the two countries, promote dialogue among civilizations. As uh, the president just said during his interview with Xinhua News Agency yesterday, China and Greece are both devoted to just to argue against the idea of clashes of civilization. Real civilizations won't clash. They, just will, they will just communicate and help each other to grow. So we do believe that China and Greece, with the promotion of high-quality belt and road construction, will work together to promote the communication and exchanges between different civilizations, and to work together to build a community of shared future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for Director Wendy Chen. Uh, he just gave us a very clear, comprehensive, but also a very enlightenment speech to us. From his speech, I have a deep impression that his presentation gave us a lot of new ideas and new information. How to say that? Because I, I, I just make a, such a summary that one is the new milestones, which means that the president or the prime minister visited China, especially the president will attend the Asian Civilization Dialogue. This will be a new milestone to high-level dialogue between China and Greece. The other new is about the new advancement that you know that just the last China CE summit, uh, Greece had become the new member of this framework. I think this is a very new advancement, which can inspire uh, can inspire a lot of cooperation be, uh, bilateral at a bilateral dimension. Uh, the third new uh, third new is about the new development, and I have heard that he make a lot of uh, analysis on the joint construction of the Belt and the Road Initiative. This is also a new, very new development between China and Greece. Anyway, now you can see that we have a lot of new dimension between China and Greece at the bilateral dimension, at the sixteen plus one dimension, also China-EU dimension, and also Belt and Road dimension. So we have so many dimensions with each other. Also, after the second Belt Road Summit, we have seen new vision and a new starting point between uh, two countries. And uh, uh, I strongly believe that in the future, we will have a, a very new high quality development ties between China and Greece. Thank you. Thank you for your very excellent uh, speech for the participant. Thank you. Uh, uh, the second panelist, uh, we would like to invite uh, Plato Rokos Sakali Leris. Professor at uh, Athens University of Economics and Business, and Honor Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Please take your floor. Okay, thank you very much. Let me start uh, first by thanking the organizers um, for inviting me to this uh, conference that brings together a Greek institution together with a Chinese uh, institution. Today I would like to uh, speak about the relationship of the European Union uh, with China, focusing on some important economic aspects that uh, I believe affect it. This bilateral relationship is governed by geopolitics and geoeconomics, two very important concepts linguistically rooted in Greek language, bringing together politics and economics, and I'm glad to see that uh, here we have uh, brought together both political scientists and economists to speak about these issues. The common root of uh, both of these aspects is geo, geography. And this is the most important element, I think, of the European Union-China relationship, the fact that both belong to Eurasia. So both are directly affected by developments in the neighborhood and have a keen interest in stability peace and prosperity in the two continents. The European Union is currently facing several challenges on its path to closer integration and cohesion. 
One of these, and this is the only one that I will address uh, today, is to figure out how to position itself in a world that is turning bipolar. The unipolar world that emerged in the 1990s is certainly long gone, as China has emerged as a superpower in military and economic terms. In addition, there are global economic forces at play that are shaping politics, commerce, productivity, and the movement of people. These forces are giving rise to economies of scale, so larger players enjoy advantages. Smaller players suffer disadvantages. The global economic forces at play that I'm referring to include, uh, first, skill-biased technological change that gets diffused globally. Second, globalization and offshoring of productive economic activity. Third, global integration of financial markets with enormous cross-border flows of capital. Fourth, large-scale movements of people seeking security and economic well-being. And fifth, global warming and associated efforts to make the Earth's environment sustainable. These are all global challenges that require global solutions. The European Union, as long as it is strong and united, can play a critical role in bringing the two poles, that is the United States and China, together in addressing the above global issues. The European Union and China have strong interest in coming together to address global challenges, but also to come together, that is, in order to promote the welfare of their citizens. The Belt and Road Initiative is only one aspect of such potential cooperation. Since I'm speaking uh, here to a majority of Greek participants, I will first devote some time analyzing some trends that I see in the Chinese economy and how I think they will impact European economic growth and welfare. I will then outline how they will naturally lead to mutual gains for both Europeans and Chinese from cooperation. And I hope that our esteemed Chinese guests will excuse my foray into territories that are much more familiar uh, to them. China has managed to achieve uh, an economic growth miracle based on strategies with specific ingredients. There's no time in this session to uh, go through these ingredients in depth, so I will just summarize that they have in the later stages, uh, at least, depended heavily on massive domestic investment, partly fueled by credit expansion, and leading to current account surpluses. It is not difficult to see that going forward, this economic model, this growth model, is untenable. And let us see why. First, currently in China, investment and consumption have about equal shares in gross domestic product. In OECD economies, the ratio is about one to three when it comes to investment relative to China. That is one for investment, three for consumption. As rates of domestic investment projects, rates of return of domestic investment projects fall, and the emerging middle class strives to spend more, China will make its way to higher consumption growth. Second, population aging. This is already happening and certain to accelerate further, and this will naturally bring this saving and higher consumption growth. A consequence of both these phenomena is that the current account surplus will disappear. Actually, it has disappeared already, and it will turn into deficit. This is because the current account balance is simply, just and identically, the difference of saving minus investment in an economy. We actually see already that China is running a significant deficit in services, mostly coming from, uh, mostly due to tourism. So what does this mean? I will concentrate on two impacts. First, that the Chinese consumer will be a key driving force for global economic growth, a role that has been played up to now mostly by the US consumer. 
The, the flip side of this conclusion is that China will require foreign capital in order to finance its savings shortfall. This is also known as a current account deficit. This foreign capital will naturally come from countries with current account surpluses. Will it be Germany? Will it be Japan? Foreign financing into China can either come in the form of foreign direct investment, in other words, acquisition, say by Germans, of Chinese companies, assets and technology, or in the form of shorter term financing, that is possibly uh, consumers of, of consumer spending. In this new macroeconomic framework, the European Union will want to have good access to the Chinese consumer as a seller of goods and services to this consumer and to Chinese companies, assets and technology as an investor. This will bring focus on achieving bilateral investment treaties and leveling the playing field in terms of state subsidies to the corporate sector on both sides. It is clear to me that protectionism should be avoided by both sides as it is a lose-lose strategy. The second impact I would like to refer to of the emergence of current account deficits in China will manifest itself on the Belt and Road Initiative. A reversal in the current account balance will imply that there will no longer be a massive need each year for the Chinese to finance the rest of the world. One such destination, of course, being projects in the Belt and Road Initiative. Instead, it will be necessary to carefully manage in the most productive and profitable way the stock of net foreign assets that China had amassed during the years that it was enjoying current account surpluses. In other words, the Chinese will turn from investment decisions of a fast increasing pool of net savings to the managing of an existing stock of assets. Carefully managing a large but not rapidly increasing portfolio of assets will require of China very different skills. Instead of rapid expansion, China will have to invest into carefully selected projects according to the criteria of bankability, economic sustainability, solidly based on environmental and social impact assessment and transparent procurement. The European Union could assist in this effort, especially through the expertise amassed by the European Investment Bank, which is the European Union's bank. The establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, in Beijing is a prescient move, in my opinion, in this direction. The European Investment Bank has contributed largely into its formation and orientation. It would be beneficial if the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, got ever more involved in financing infrastructure, and particularly that related to the BRI. I would like to move now to another co topic of economic uh, cooperation. Part of being uh, a developed and advanced uh, economy, let alone an economic superpower as China already is, is taking up responsibility of providing overseas development assistance, also known as ODA. This has been traditionally provided as grants to poor and needy regions of the world. However, it is now evident in the circles of development finance that the most effective way of providing overseas development assistance is different. Evidence shows that it is better to grant free equity to projects or portfolios of projects that directly meet the needs of developing countries but still require to be financed in part by loans. This blending of grants and loans is affected because it uses overseas development assistance as a way of attracting private funds to developing economies by reducing the amount of risk involved in the investment. An example may help uh, here. Instead of giving as a gift one plant of solar energy generators, 
The assistance can involve providing the equity for free for a portfolio of such plans. The rest of the, the, rest of the financing can come from private sources that now will face lower risk as the equity part will absorb all potential first losses. This form of overseas development assistance requires close coordination among different donors. As the European Union is the largest provider of overseas development assistance in the world, responsible, responsible for about two-thirds of it at the moment, it will be a natural partner for China. Again, the European Investment Bank is a natural conduit of expertise and financial capital. Beyond economic efficiency, one of the benefits of coordination between the European Union and China on ODA is that the supported themes of development will be decided in common in order to address issues that could menace Eurasia, such issues may be immigration that is forced for economic reasons and in specific countries, or terrorism and extremism. In conclusion, it is crystal clear in my mind that enhanced cooperation between the European Union and China is mutually beneficial for Europeans. China is a challenge and an opportunity. With the right policies, cooperation can lead to enhanced welfare for both of our peoples. The Belt and Road Initiative will evolve and be part of an important aspect of such cooperation as I hope I have described it earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Uh, a very uh, professional analysis. Uh, give us a lot of expertise from a financial uh, perspective. Uh, I have noticed uh, uh, some very interesting uh, topics uh, which really touch my thinking. For example, you mentioned that the uh, small player and the bigger player, they have a, a stay at an asymmetric position. And the small player only enjoy the disadvantage and the bigger only enjoy the advantage. Uh, especially, I noticed that the central and the eastern countries, they are all the emerging economy or small open economy, they also enjoy some disadvantage. So this is a good question to how to deal with some disadvantage and promote the uh, development. Also, I'm uh, thankful to your very professional analysis for China's economic miracle. I think uh, this year I hear a very impressive analysis. Um, Generally speaking, in the past, our uh, economic development uh, rely heavily on three engines, uh, investment, export, and uh, consumption. And uh, in your presentation, um, I really uh, harvest a lot of that, uh, because for the three engines, the consumption is uh, the most weakest uh, point for our economic development. And uh, from your analysis, you give us a lot of expertise and. Uh, uh, suggestion how to promote the consumption in China since you're the uh, uh, population age and other European the advantage to promote our consumption and uh, also I would thank you very much for your uh, new analysis on the ODA the uh, overseas development assistance on this side we know that the European Union is really good at this and China is not only in the uh, uh, the biggest benefit from EU the ODA, but also we learned the lessons and experience from the European Union. So I think in this area we have strong uh, co cooperation with each other. Anyway, I also uh, want to emphasize that uh, China now try to cooperate with some international financial institution, EBRD or even EIB, to promote some cooperation with each other. So in the future we have a strong uh, cooperation position with each other. Thank you for your very, very professional analysis for our participant. And uh, our last uh, panelist uh, is, uh, is a Professor Emilios Avigolis uh, from the, um, the University of Edinburgh, distinguished visiting professor, University of Hong Kong.
Yeah, please speak. Thank no? you. You need a PowerPoint? Uh, no. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is a forward, is a back. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much to the Foundation and Tsinghua for the invitation to this um, excellent event. Um, and especially to Admiral Mazarakis for being such a kind uh, uh, host and, coordin and efficient coordinator. Um, there are four rules for a successful um, address, uh, for a successful talk. The first is don't talk too much. The second is don't try to resolve the problem because people will feel offended. The third is don't be out of context. And the fourth is don't have slides. Make the audience focus on you. Apart from the third, thanks to my good friend and very highly esteemed colleague Plutarchos, I'll bridge everything else. Uh, <laughs> I, I have also the uh, rare honor of representing um, academic institutions of the highest standing, both in the West and the East, as well as being a part-time and unwilling uh, policymaker. So, um, what I'm going to explain is that we are now in the BR2 phase, which um, faces um, uh, two massive challenges. The first is sustainability, and the second is uh, sustainability in all forms, uh, uh, environmental sustainability, debt sustainability, uh, project investment sustainability, on which um, uh, Plutarch has touched uh, um, uh, earlier. Yeah. And of course, a few solutions uh, which, in my view, include marketability. Now, um, we all know that there are massive global infrastructure needs. As a matter of fact, they exceed 3.7 trillion per year. Who is going to meet them? Definitely not the capital markets which have plugged the gap in the past. Why? Because they have become extremely short-termist. Definitely not the banks. Why? Because the new capital requirements are restraining the banks from uh, engaging into long-term funding. Uh, the numbers, the figures are staggering and as is the funding gap. And as a matter of fact, if you include, as you can see, the funding gap is 2.7 trillion per year. If you include the sustainable development goals, of the United Nations exceed, uh, exceed 3.5 trillion per year. Um, we do have investment banks, uh, uh, Plutarch has mentioned the European Investment Bank, but there is no way that public sector money can ever cover this gap. It's just impossible. You either tap the uh, long-term private investment markets or you will never meet the funding needs of um, humanity in order to build infrastructure and especially this key Eurasia zone. And these are the funding needs, these are and the funding gaps in the BRI countries. Um, as you can see, it's at least 1.7 trillion per year. So, um, the BRI couldn't have come at a better moment. And as a matter of fact, I mean, you can see that only the Asian Inv Infrastructure Investment Bank has approved investment for projects worth over 5.3 billion already. We're talking about staggering numbers, but still the gap is massive. And um, the BRI, without supplementary private investment, will not meet its objectives. Now, that's a bad slide, but more or less this is what um, BRI is doing uh, in terms of connections, transport hubs, bringing communities together. But if you look at these regions long and hard, what you see is a vast area where the Golden Hordes or the Mongol Empire or the Iranian Empire or the English Empire or the Russian Empire dominated for the longest of time. What you also see is an empire, you see a vast region 
where the trade in opioids has thrived, where warlords have thrived. You see countries with some lack in governance. You see countries that have been torn by war in the past. Um, you see countries with theocratic or autocratic um, regimes that squander natural wealth. I mean, I was in Dublin recently and one of my colleagues said, the EU leaders should look to the Chinese leadership, which is not what um, you expect a European statesman to say every day. And I said, why? And he said, because the Chinese leaders are the only ones in the past 30 years that have massively improved the living standards of their people. We should never forget that, that an autocracy is not necessarily the worst form of government, even though sometimes it is. So, this is what the BRI is doing right now. 60% of it is investment that goes to countries that do not even have a rating. Forget investment grade. I remember when we were discussing, when we were discussing the independence of Scotland in 2014, people were saying Scotland will sink immediately after independence because it's the grading, the rating of its sovereign debt will be very low. Forget that. These are countries that do not have even a rating. And these are countries to which um, the BRI is building roads, rail lines, bridges, power plants, both in Asia, but most importantly in Africa. So if the BRI is a good thing, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that as you looked at the map that I just shown you of the Eurasian plateau, these are regions with checkered history. These are regions that have always been the part of a much bigger geopolitical game. And affluence, and of course how is the geopolitical game played? Through local pawns, through domestic pawns. Affluence will diminish, especially if investment doesn't go through pockets. Affluence will diminish the importance of these local pawns, of these local autocrats, of the local warlords, and so on. And doing a business with unpleasant people doesn't mean that you should do unpleasant business. Now, we have all heard the objections of um, the German commissioner, of the president of the commission, the EU, and so on, for Greece and especially Italy joining the BRI. But as you know, there is a massive funding gap in both of those countries. So before we express an opinion on what a country, a sovereign country that is, should or should not do, we should also come up with a solution as to how these countries should resolve their funding needs, especially in infrastructure. Uh, the, capital, the capital stock in Greece has diminished after 10 years of a crisis. And the same is the case in Italy because after 10 years of no investment, Italy is finding itself destabilized, de finds itself having serious problem of disinvestment. Um, and of course, there has been criticism and some of that justified, but overall, the Western opinion is positive. Whether it's this chap who heads the World, uh, the World Economic Forum or the General Secretary of the United States, uh, Nations, Gutierrez, or the former President of the World Bank, and I'll show you a few statements by Christine Lagarde later, which you will not believe if you read the Western press. The overall impression in the West is, the overall reception in the West is very positive. Now, why the BRI inspires so much fear? I have already explained that it will shuffle the cards when it comes to the geopolitical game in the specific region. No two ways about it. It's inevitable that we'll reshuffle the cards. What does that mean? 
It means that China's soft power, mostly because China has never been an imperial empire, will be on the rise, other peoples on the decline. But it's not just that. There is a valid suspicion that at the same time, through the BRI, China is building an exclusive trade zone. And if you look at the numbers, it's hard to refute the fact that lots of BRI investment is going to China's main trade partners in Central and Southeast Asia. You could uh, argue with the statistics, but you cannot really because the, the source is the Bank for International Settlements, which is, uh, uh, as an objective, observer of global economic activity as it gets. So, and there is, of course, the fear of a new multilateralism where Imperial China, that has always objected to opioid trade, Imperial China lost everything because it lost the opium wars, um, has never been a malicious force in the region, will now have a say through its money. What we call in Britain, put your money where your mouth is. This is what the um, People's Republic of China is doing right now. Now, there is criticism. The main criticism, and some of that is valid, the main criticism focuses on debt and debt dependence. Is China creating debt colonies in uh, Africa? Does it exploit vulnerable countries in order to have a cheap access to their mineral uh, resources? Is merely a means to export Chinese overcapacity? Will China exploit the strength of the economic ties uh, with BRI countries to reinforce its political influence? Before I get to the green challenges and the investment challenges, let me read you a statement by Christine Lagarde the week before the last at the Belt and Road Forum. I would like to recommend to commend President Xi and the Chinese government for their leadership. Consider Kazakhstan, where a new manufacturing zone is beginning to unleash its previously untapped economic potential, exactly the kind of country where there has been no meaningful investment before. Oh, look at Senegal, that's Christine Lagarde, where robust economic growth of over 6% in each of the last four years was supported partly by BRI-linked investment projects, including the construction of a new highway linking the airport to three large cities. So, two of the matter is, more or less the BRI has succeeded already. What's the next step? The next step is to focus on the criticism, especially the valid criticism, and find remedies. Now, the first problem is infrastructure has an environmental impact. Any infrastructure investment has environmental impact, whether it's Chinese, whether it's American, whether it's Greek infrastructure investment, infrastructure investment construction has an environmental impact. It doesn't have an ideology. It just doesn't have an impact. You cannot escape that. And if you want to alleviate the impact, you need to create processes. You need to create standards and you need to create bodies that will monitor compliance with the standards. There are very good examples of serious infrastructure projects in Greece, especially the high dynamic, uh, dynamic projects that have destroyed entire regions in central Greece. Greece, a first world country, member of the EU, and so on, couldn't care less about environmental status. So, there's no escape from that. This either will be standardized through harmonized standards with an independent monitoring body, or the criticism will continue. The second is investment sustainability. Some of the investments have not been successful. 
Now, I would say, the critic in me, the um, devil's advocate in me would say, but that was the whole point. The whole point is that you go in countries that has never been um, substantial infrastructure investment before, and you know what, some of that will fail. But it's becoming a problem. As you can see, the fail to success ratio is much higher than one would expect from private investment projects. Now, is the BRI compatible or incompatible with sustainability, especially sustainable development goals, environmental sustainability? The answer is absolutely. What the UN wants is what the China is putting its money to achieve. The big challenge is how these two trains will meet instead of running in parallel. How these two powerful trains for economic and social development will run through the same rails rather than ships running, passing each other in the night. The most important, of course, is connectivity. Connectivity alters local power dynamics. Connectivity brings community investment. Connectivity brings cultural and education exchanges. Connectivity brings social and personal growth. So, if everybody agrees that the um, Belt and Road Initiative and the sustainability, the United Nations Sustainability Goals for 2030 are entirely compatible, how are we going to make them work together? That's the biggest challenge. The other is, of course, debt sustainability. Now, unfortunately, another bad slide, but this is how the Belt and Road on the uh, first column is helping the countries that receive Belt and Road investment or loans to achieve the uh, United Nations sustainability goals. Um, so what is the BRI2? Who is the godmother or the godfather? Well, it seems that the godmother is Christine Lagarde again, who says, history has taught us that if not managed carefully, infrastructure investments can lead to a problematic increase in debt. Secondly, to be fully successful, the Belt and Road should only go where it is needed. I would add today that it should only go where it is sustainable in all aspects. And what she calls BRI 2.0 can also benefit from increased transparency, open procurement, competitive bidding, better risk assessment in project selection. 26th of April 2009, Christine Lagarde in Beijing. Everybody, this. How do you adopt a reformed framework to meet sustainability, um, sustainability objectives? And also, how do you close the funding gap? First of all, I think we need a more transparent governance framework and standards that will, without any exemption, without any exception, will tie up BRI funding to meeting the sustainability development goals, which means that every project should have a sustainability feasibility study. Now, the big question is why should we go to the, that length and the expense? I will answer that question in a while. Now, the second is, and Pluto has touched upon that, reform the funding policies, the investment policies. China can become a major direct investor, get where loans go, put equity in, because that exactly will attract, will attract private investments. Even if you think in terms of Modigliani-Miller, it lowers, lowers the leverage, and everything that lowers the leverage attracts more credit, correct, and more sustainable credit. 
So there are far too many reasons, and in China's best interest, that China should become more of an investor and less of a creditor. Also, if you have more skin in the game, as I said, some of these regimes neither have the capability and capacity nor the desire to perform all these necessary sustainability checks and balances and so on. If China remains a major investor, retains a major skin in the game, will also have a say. It's not just, here is the money, do whatever you like with them. As you know, the Malaysian president, when Malaysia opened its first development bank, people put in the development bank 4.5 billion. That's the former, the former prime minister. And what happened uh, next, the money became um, funded Hollywood movies and for Hollywood actresses in various yachts, funded um, uh, private expenses and so on. So with the help of Goldman Sachs, they managed to filter out 4.5 billion. But if China has a say, that will not happen. If you think all the criticism about the BRI that comes from Malaysia, it's nothing else but frustration that 4.5 billion of Malaysian savers' money ended up in Hollywood. Now, transparency and accountability. How and environmental and, and economic and social responsibility. How all that will be achieved? I think it's inevitable that the green standards have already been agreed with the United Nations and China. China, as a matter of fact, is very proactive in issuing green standards and fostering compliance with green development standards. These are Chinese statutes which implement international um, sustainability uh, statutes and standards into domestic Chinese law. So these are legally binding in China. But who and why? Who should monitor them? Why? What is the feasibility case for adopting them, for spending money on all of that? For, for what's the cost-benefit analysis for going into so many lengths? First of all, it buys legitimacy, it buys goodwill. The government of X, Y, Z country can say whatever they like in accordance with their best interests, but facts matter as well. And facts are sticky. Especially, especially if, if the green compliance body is an independent intergovernmental body where the development banks also have a say, that will buy the BRI massive credibility when it comes to sustainability. The second is, without private investor money, the funding gap cannot close. And the only way to, uh, to attract private investor money is to comply with the sustainability standards that the trustees and the investment managers of all Western um, uh, institutional investors have foisted upon them by their, uh, by their savers, by their governments, by the international organizations, by their polities. So the only way to close the funding gap is private, Western private investment. The only way to attract Western private investment is to comply in a way that it's independently, credibly verified by an independent body with sustainability standards. Otherwise, the trustees and the investment managers will breach their fiduciary duties and will uh, face suits for compensation or even going to prison. The United States or Germany or England are not Malaysia. So these guys have to account for every penny they invest. I'm afraid there is no Hollywood. That was one off. So, um, and what else? What else will prevent private investment from pouring into that region? Marketability. 
if there is no exit, if there is no secondary market in those investments, if there is no possibility that I can divest of my stake and move to the next investment, I will not go. I will not go in because long-term investments are very unsafe. I will not go in because long-term investments are very liquid. And I might have specific requirements in my investment mandate that I cannot meet if there is no secondary market that will allow me to get out. So, the first step, I think, is a green board for BRI projects agreed, of course, jointly between China and the multilateral development organizations that, um, that uh, participate in the BRI and support uh, China's activity in the BRI. Of course, the, question e the obvious objection is uh, China will never accept that, but that's not true. The truth of the matter is that the Commercial Court or the Commercial Arbitration Court in Beijing has 50 foreigners and 20 Chinese experts. 50 foreigners. Some of them very, very senior judges in Britain and the United States. So of course China will accept that. Provided it's properly built and it's not a policy tool for a rival power. The second, I think, is building a market for BRI stakes, building a primary market for BRI stakes and building a secondary market for BRI stakes. And because these are highly complex instruments, cross-border markets, all kinds of problems will be involved from disclosure rules to capital controls. The solution is a distributed ledger technology platform that tokenizes investments and doesn't have anything to fear from capital controls or cross-border compliance. That's going to be my keynote speech in Hong Kong in a couple of weeks' time, but these are the basic, uh, these are the basic um, uh, resources of what I suggest. Now, the other advantage that this has is that every country, every nation has wealth. The reason, the reason that this is not represented in balance sheet terms, it's because it's not monetized. I'm involved with a private organization that right now is trying to monetize the receipts of the Ethiopian provincial governments. It's trying to monetize natural resources in Mongolia. This is the way forward, but unless you have a market, Nobody knows who is, who is going to be involved in unless you have an open, transparent, globally accessible market. Nobody knows what XYZ will be doing with those resources. The fact that they are monetized doesn't mean that they, they, sh they cannot be misallocated. Anything but. So a global, transparent market, a blockchain-based market, will increase transparency and governance of such a market. Now, finally, why should China do that? Hard gains. Western institutional investors will pour in and close the funding gap. Marketability and transferability will increase risk sharing. Why these, these investments fail? Because they are not adequately diversified, because the country is not investable. What does it mean that the country is not investable? that the high risk is very high. So what's the solution? Not to invest? No. The solution is risk-sharing agreements, risk-sharing arrangements. So this is the hard gain of what I suggest. And of course, it will close the funding gap, which according to HSBC stands at 4.28 4 trillion until the BRI comes to fruition. And of course, there are soft gains. You enhance the legitimacy of the BRI in the Western eyes, and the average Western citizen or reader of Western news doesn't know what Lagarde has said, doesn't know what the former president of the World Bank has said about the BRI, doesn't know what Schwab has said about the BRI. They only know what is the view of their government about the BRI, so it will seriously enhance legitimacy in the eyes of the Western politicians and the Western investors, 
And one would hope, and that's just, that's just a wish, it will widen economic, uh, and economic growth and peace alliance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, let's just check the time. Uh, oh, uh, <coughs> to, to be frank, this is uh, uh, one of the best uh, presentation uh, I have heard on the Belt Road uh, infrastructure, infrastructure building, uh, infrastructure building, and. Um, um, thank you for your positive uh, uh, analysis of our China the BRI uh, proposal, and you also mentioned the global investment gap and uh, how to fill in the gap uh, from China. At the China domestic level, we saw this gap very successfully. This is only uh, this is one of the reasons why China have created a miracle of economy because we have saw our Infrastructure, infrastructure gap uh, from domestic uh, dimension. But at the international dimension, it's very difficult because it's not decided by China on its own. It's decided by a lot of uh, stakeholders, a lot of countries. This is a key issue that uh, why we call the Belt and Road Initiative, we need to invite all the relevant stakeholders to joint construction, joint discussion, and joint benefits. So this, maybe this is China's wisdom to do that. Uh, also, we, we found that uh, uh, there is a very constructive analysis from the chief of uh, economists. You mentioned that uh, the Belt Road Initiative should go, should not go where it is needed. It should go where it is uh, sustainable. I think it's also very, very important for our next, uh, or you say the Belt Road uh, second version, uh, is also very important. Uh, so these, uh, your Construction, uh, your, your constructive analysis or policy suggestion uh, is also enlightenment to all of us, especially for our decision makers, for Chinese government. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, in summary, I think it's uh, involved in some key issue. I mean, the financing approach, how to solve the financing approach. Uh, on this regard, China has made some improvement. Firstly, we rely heavily on the concession loans we found there are some problems. Then we promote the direct investment. Also, we promote the PPP, public and private cooperation. Lastly, we hope that we can get more financial support from the European Union. So this is the show that, uh, this is show that China tried to diversify its approaching, uh, financing approach. Despite uh, we are on the path of the solve this issue, but in the future, I think, uh, we rely heavily on our experts, our uh, professors, to give us some constructive uh, policy suggestions. So thank you very much for your very successful presentation on the BRI. Thank you very much. OK, now we have maybe have only 10 minutes to make a discussion on our panelist speech. And uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. OK, what's this? Please. Microphone. Thank you. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Lady first. No yeah. Lady first. No problem. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Yanulu. I'm a lawyer. And uh, I think with Mr. Avulez, we were students together at the law school in Athens. Don't so. Really no. <laughs> I'm much prettier than you, so I'm not afraid. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> At least. No. Um, as a lawyer who is um, also involved in uh, matters of um, the environment, and uh, we are trying to, um, in, in a way, protect the environment in Greece with no uh, big success, um, what I would like to ask Mr. Avulez is, um, from my uh, very bad experience, I am in cases where you have a lot of money available, uh, at least in, in parts of the world like Greece, 
which is uh, not much different than Africa or parts in Asia. Uh, where, in cases where you have a lot of money available, uh, instead of doing good, you're doing uh, bigger damage. So, for example, we have uh, the case, as you mentioned, of the river Achelos, uh, in which we have tried and managed to stop the uh, changing of the route of the, the river. In, 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 this, uh, in this case, all environmental uh, organizations in Greece have said that it will be a very damaging um, intervention. And uh, it, we succeeded to stop it partially um, thanks to legal actions. So, if in, what I would like to ask is, what happens in cases where money is so fluent and available that instead of doing good, you're doing bigger damage? And uh, th this is in the, th this is my my main concern. Thank you very much. So maybe uh, one question, one answer. Okay. So yeah, maybe. Well, I think whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, Greece with the Ahelos project, which when renewals have taken over the world. It will be good for nothing, especially in a country like Greece that when the technology to store energy from renewals becomes available has no reason to use coal or destroy the environment and so on. So what's the solution? The solution is um, feasibility studies, sustainability studies that look into the future in the same way um, who can say that the British uh, pension system is solvent because it's solvent today? The big question is if it's going to be uh, solvent 20 years from now. They just hiked and hiked and hiked the contributions. I mean, in the case of the academic professors or the academic teachers' pension uh, fund, it looks like a very rich fund, but it will be bust in 20 years, so they just increased again, uh, they hacked our contributions, and they hacked the employers' contributions, then they nearly shut it down, because in 20 years' time, we'll not be able to provide pensions. I think the same applies to environmental and debt sustainability. Forward-looking studies are the key at the end of the day, the project will not be ready or available in a couple of years. And we do have the standards. The UN standards are, are very rigorous. The OECD standards are very rigorous. The question, a question remains, who is going to apply them and who is going to monitor compliance with them? And that's the most important issue. And I fear that cannot be resolved easily because that's an issue for domestic governance. Last this, please. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Let me just say I'm very fortunate to be working with Professor Avglas about a paper on institutional investors in I the met you. I met you as a student of Professor Sekulares. Of course, of course. Sekulares was the, the first uh, teacher I've ever had in Athens University uh, of Business. But, uh, it was so the we, fortunate thing in your life. It was. But uh, so when we did our research, we basically saw two Chinas, two different Chinas. Let's say the old state-centric China with institutions like the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank, where basically the standards of infrastructure investments are very different from the new China, which is the AIB, the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank. And when we look towards the AIB, they are the best in the world, perhaps on par with the World Bank. So my question is, how could we nudge our Chinese friends to move towards the AIB model with very high standards, with feasibility studies and with multilateral approach to development instead of bilateral state centric. Thank you. Very, very challenging question. Yeah. Uh, something. Uh, a little bit coming to the previous uh, debate. The way that the multilateral development banks have tried to address the issue that uh, 
the lawyer uh, mentioned earlier and that we discussed uh, earlier too, is through appropriate corporate governance. And this is also what Vasilis was saying, that uh, AIIB has that, let's say, more appropriate corporate governance and uh, than China Development Bank and uh, so on. So what do you do? You have corporate governors, board of governors, board of directors, and so on. They require that you have policies. This is energy policy. You have social po uh, social uh, sustainability policy and uh, environment uh, sustainability policy. You have risk management uh, policies. You have all of these policies that are associated with different aspects. Then the bank itself undergoes through due diligence. And this due diligence has to basically uh, comply with all these policies that have been approved by these multilateral parties. And this is very important so that these are not just China and not just uh, Greece, but it's, let's say, in the AIB, or if the AIB became the BRI uh, bank, it would be all the different countries that would be involved and also observers on this. So one way of uh, basically coming to uh, what Vasilis uh, was saying is actually, uh, which is not necessarily uh, politically feasible, is actually converting the AIIB into a BRI bank. But with many, uh, so a multilateral development bank, mostly specialized and focused on uh, BRI, uh, with uh, standards that are on par with those of uh, EIB, World Bank, EBRD, and uh, so on. I'm not saying that uh, this av all avoids all problems, but then, uh, believe me, because I worked in a multilateral development bank, NGOs, such as I think the one that uh, you are uh, involved in, are one of the most engaged stakeholders and are recognized by multilateral development banks as very engaged and very important uh, stakeholders in the whole process of checking whether those standards have been met, and if they have not been met, uh, for appropriate uh, penalties of different sorts, not necessarily monetary, to be meted uh, upon the uh, particular financing body. And um, if I could add, uh, because indeed I have been very fortunate to meet at Tsinghua Vasilis. Uh, um, in 2007, November, I had a keynote in the um, 17th um, uh, PSC Commercial or Congress, and uh, uh, Plutarchus suggested that I met Vasilis, and that was a very fortunate event in my life, and eventually I have helped him to do a paper on, um, because as a matter of fact, Vasilis is the key player, and the uh, main author on institutional investors and uh, Western institutional investors and the BRI. So uh, what Plutarchus mentioned is the stick, but there is a carrot. And the BRI will never taste that carrot unless they build up sustainability uh, compliance and monitoring with uh, uh, sustainability standards because the Western institutional investors will not come in. Why they will not come in? Because their investment mandates prevent them from coming in, and that's the carrot. If you want private money, and eventually they will need private money because there is no other way to close the funding gap, that's the way. Uh, the last question, yeah. Mm. Microphone, please, yeah. Microphone, yeah, please. Thank you. I just wanted to mention, have you factored in when you mention about the environmental impact, the trade restructuring that might uh, ease the environmental burden at the end of the day? Because uh, as um, trade restructuring may shorten distances, it's not necessarily good for shipping, but uh, we might have there two effects. One is a trade partner substitute, which will shorten distance, and the other is a modal substitute, which will favor overland, the overland uh, BRI route than the maritime BRI route. So mm. have you factored that in? <laughs> mm. Excellent question. <laughs> the kind of question that economists think about. So you're thinking about the general equilibrium. When, the, when development finance happens, it's actually a partial equilibrium. So you're looking basically at the project that you're financing, at the local effects, and very little about what possibly this project would mean about the global reshuffling of trade routes and so on. So it's an excellent question, but it certainly is not practiced that way. Maybe it should be. 
I, I find that we, there are still two minutes left. I would like to ask a question to the banker. Um, uh, according to the uh, logic, who is the uh, contributor to the bank uh, system who will be decided the final result? I mean that if China contribute to the EBRD, become the first stakeholder, he will decide the arrangement. I think this is also a transparent uh, governance. So this is the key issue that uh, maybe we can have some bilateral partnership with each other, no problem. But uh, anyway, if you uh, rely on the logic, the decide logic, you think that I think that who have uh, contributed the most money, he will decide the result. Who will decide the regulation according to our mind. I think this uh, process is also transparent. I'm the biggest contributor, so I can. Uh, make any regulation according to my uh, requirement. Do you think so? Talking about um, general equilibrium and incentives, that's a one trillion question. Mm -hmm. Why, if I put my money in it, or I am the biggest contributor, should they listen to you, World Bank, private investor, Green Standards Board, and so on? And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is that uh, there are the benefits that you cannot quantify. And um, yeah, it's going to be a massive challenge for China to accept that the ultimate arbiter will be somebody else than the country that is putting the money. On the other hand, China is already accepting that dispute resolution should be, um, should be handled uh, and disputes should be adjudicated by an independent body. So I think the first uh, China has already made the first step, but I do agree with you. The second step is going to be the hardest. Uh, the recipient countries should be putting money too. It's not that they are penniless. And it, they have, they're putting money, they are shareholders in the World Bank. They are, if they're in Asia, they're shareholders in Asian Development Bank. If they're in Africa, they're in African Development Bank. If they're European, they're in the European Investment Bank. So certainly it will not be only China that will be financing. And they will be putting capital that would then raise bonds in order to finance that. Yeah, so China will probably have the, the largest stake, but it will certainly not be uh, the only stake there. In the views. Uh, now we have to finish this uh, section. I think we have a very uh, successful discussion, a uh, very successful presentation for our panelists. I would like to thank you very much for your contribution for our this section. Okay, that's, that's the next section. Yeah, thank you.